Friend of the Court, Enemy of the Family, Questions and Answers are from Chapter 13 of the book by Carol Rhodes, Compliments of the Author and United Earth Fund. Here are some commonly asked questions. Question 1. My brother said that he feels that the court system castrated him from his ability to be a father to his children and to remain an active part in their lives when all he was guilty of was having a wife that found another partner. Why are the agencies so biased against fathers? Answer. From the judges to the prosecutor's offices to the child support enforcement agencies and all the institutions in between, welfare, social services, child protective services, women's shelters, many police agencies, the media, legal aid, most attorneys and society in general, there is the erroneous fixation on the 60s stereotype of the affluent businessman father who dumps his family to run off with his glamorous young secretary. In reality, however, the post-no-fault divorce era, it is the woman who files for divorce in 98% of cases against a man who does not want the divorce at all. Before the 1970s, the two main reasons cited for divorce were, one, unfaithfulness, and two, alcoholism with failure to financially support the family. In the 1980s and 90s, the two main reasons given for divorce were, Number one, incompatibility. And number two, unhappiness with the existing relationship. The whole system of domestic relations law is set up to deal with the so-called deadbeat dad. The resulting frustrations of the bias system creates deadbeat dads, or dads who have been emotionally beaten to death. There is nothing in the legal system that can even admit the existence of deadbeat moms who have nothing to lose and everything to gain by playing the system. There are many ways for mothers to play the system, and one way is to pose as a typical innocent victim who needs to protect herself and the children from the father. Tears and pleading and tales of a woeful and miserable past are all the judges seem to hear. Besides, the child support agencies benefit from increased caseloads and increased revenue. It has long been a sociological fact that men, in general, still earn more money per capita than their spouses do. It is financially convenient to award custody to women and the responsibility to pay to men, assumed to be already established in steady careers. Question two, how can a person avoid getting amputated from one's own children? Answer, do all within your power to stay out of and away from the child support enforcement agencies in the court system. If you don't want to turn over your children and their futures to unknowing and uncaring institutional mentalities, take every precaution to prevent eventual involvement. Never have intimate relationships with partners that do not share your own solid family standards. In other words, don't date someone you wouldn't want to marry or that has a background of divorce. This may sound harsh and judgmental, but you can like, befriend, and even love an emotional basket case without sleeping with or producing children with that person who always seems to be down on his or her luck. It is amazing how many rescuers take on poor victimized women or men with dubious backgrounds, feeling sorry for them, sharing children and all they possess only to become victims themselves, discarded in the wake of the new rescuer. Be as cautious about intimately connecting with troubled and unstable partners as you would be to embrace the HIV virus itself. Should you find that you are suddenly expecting to be a parent, marry the mother of your child. Unwed fathers are discriminated against more than any others. The only rights that an unwed father has is to pay for and support a child he may never even meet. If you are married and separated, do all you can to reconcile. If you are still together, make every sacrifice to work things out for everyone's good. Once the police or attorneys or courts become involved in your relationship, only disaster can result. Never strike your partner or walk out on your family. These actions work in the movies, but they guarantee disaster in the courtroom. Question three, what is the difference between a plaintiff and a defendant? Answer, a lot. A plaintiff is the person who first files a complaint or a petition asking the court to grant an order. In domestic relations, family matters, cases, papers must be filed in circuit or family court according to each state's court rules. Generally, the other party to the case as well as that party's attorney must be properly served or given a copy of the papers to inform all parties that a case has been started. The defendant is the person against whom the case is filed. 
Question four. My wife and I are having serious problems in our marriage. We have gone to counseling and it isn't helping. We both want to get away from each other, but the kids are in the middle. I've heard that the person who goes to an attorney first or who files for custody first has a big advantage. Should I beat her to it and file first? My answer. Even though you are right that there is a definite advantage in being the first to file for temporary custody, remember that after a person goes to an attorney and files, the result will probably be irreversible. When children are involved, the worst marriage is usually better than the best divorce. Give counseling, prayer, time and effort, everything you have before taking that fateful first step. It is possible that the other parent may beat you to the draw in filing papers, but it is just as possible that a breakup can be averted in one of a dozen different ways. The court system wreaks havoc in the lives of all family members, but the ones with the most to lose in the present system are the father and the children. Try sitting down with your spouse and working out a fair and equitable compromise on the issues. Then write it down and sign it. If reconciliation utterly fails repeatedly, get a computer divorce form and work out a just separation agreement with the best interests of the children in mind that specifies that the parents will share joint physical and legal custody and that child-rearing expenses will be shared with no child support nor welfare involved. Sign and date the agreement and keep two copies on file. If the agreement can be witnessed, it would be even better. Subsequently, if the marriage continues, no one loses face nor exorbitant legal expenditures. If the marriage fails, the first step to an equitable settlement has already been forged. I would strongly recommend prenuptial agreements stating that if either parent in the marriage should opt for a no-fault divorce, that the parent desiring the disillusion should concede to leave the custody of the children and the marital home to the decision of the faithfully remaining partner. To be the first to file for temporary custody is to gain an advantage, but to reconcile with the children's other parent is to win a far greater victory. Question 5. My wife will have no choice but to go on welfare if she walks out on me. Isn't it true that when a woman goes on aid and claims that the children are in her care, that the friend of the court or child support enforcement agency automatically assigns the custody of the children to the parent receiving welfare for them? Answer. Yes, unfortunately, you are right there. If your wife walks out and leaves the children with you and you have reason to suspect she may file for aid or welfare, run, don't walk to an attorney and pay whatever the cost to apply for temporary custody of your children. Whoever applies first has the advantage. Question six. My wife and I disagree about everything. I can't get her to agree with me on anything lately. What should I do? Answer. For one thing, no matter how angry she gets, never strike her or even wound her in self-defense. No pushing, shoving. If she becomes physically violent, call the police. It is contrary to the male image to call the police to defend oneself from a woman, but legally it is essential. Number two, do not walk out and leave her and the kids overnight. This action is interpreted as abandonment. Number three, if she leaves overnight, do all within your power to be certain that the children stay at the house with you. It may require that you miss work or expend vast resources arranging for the children's care, but it will be essential to any father who does not want to lose his rights of fatherhood later on. When it comes to children and custody issues, possession is nine points of the law. Question seven. I would like to save the money but don't know enough about how to write my own order. Isn't it worth it just to go to a lawyer for that kind of thing? Answer. Saving money is only secondary to saving the children, the family, and possibly even the marriage. An order that is written by or agreed to by both parents is likely to be approved by the court if the court cannot see that the uncontested order will cause the children to suffer neglect. In other words, if two parents can agree on an order, it doesn't have to be all that sophisticated. If you want an example to go by, ask a friend in your area that has recently been through a divorce if you can borrow photocopies of the divorce order. Use the borrowed forms as an outline to be certain that you get all the pertinent information included in your petition or order. 
Or you can also go to your local library and look up copies of divorce paper samples in the legal section. There may be some computer outline information that will help, as well as legal software for filling in the blanks of a computerized divorce custody form. Father's rights organizations can be very helpful as well. If you can locate a group of this type in your area, do so. Question 8. I finally got my wife to agree to meet with me this evening to work out the details of our divorce agreement. She isn't all sure that we can file our own papers, or even whether she wants to sit down and talk with me over supper. I've only got this one shot before she goes to a lawyer. What details do we need to go over together? Answer. Be certain that you at least include the following. Number one, how will the parents provide for the care and guidance of the children and who will make the important decisions about where the children will live and how much time each parent will be able to spend with the children? Ideally, joint legal and physical, I stress physical custody, will eliminate the need for the parents to haggle over parenting time visitation issues later. Legal custody sounds the best, but in reality, it means nothing in the courtroom. Be certain that you agree to share joint physical custody. Number two, how will the children's financial needs be met? Ideally, if the parents share equal access to the children and earn comparable incomes, child support may not have to be assessed to either parent, except in the case where private schooling or major expenditures need to be fairly shared by both parents. What proportion of the children's medical and dental expenses will each parent pay? Who will pay for health insurance? Number four, will either parent be able to move with the children to another state of residence? Will the parent share transportation expenses between households 50-50? Ideally, the parent picking up the children should provide that half of the transportation expense. Generally, the parent who is eager to see the child or children will gladly make the trip and will be on time. Conversely, when the other parent anticipates time with the children, that parent should be just as willing to pick them up and bring them to their home. Number five, should spousal support be involved? No, alimony is outdated unless you're a sports or movie star. Number six, how should the property of the marriage be divided? Number seven, does the wife wish to change her last name back to a previous one? Question number nine, can either parent get a custody or support order without the other parent knowing it? Answer, state court rules say that the defendant must be given a copy of the summons, complaint, petition, order, etc. whenever minor children are involved or alimony, spousal support, is requested. The paperwork must be delivered to the defendant either by a process server, a police officer, or any adult, personally, by first-class mail, or by certified or registered mail. If an incorrect address is given for the defendant, intentionally or not, and the defendant cannot be properly served or noticed, an ex parte order is often entered without the defendant knowing of such. Think of it as ex parte, left out in the dark, a one-sided decision approved by the judge. Ex parte orders are also granted when a slippery attorney can convince the judge that serious damage will occur to the wife and children if the defendant is properly served with the papers. This is a time when the personal protection order further ties the legal hands of the father. If a party disagrees with an ex parte order, it is absolutely imperative to file an objection to the order within the 14-day time frame. The objection need not be formal. A sheet of paper with the word objection written boldly across the top that includes the names and case numbers of the parties, a brief reason for the objection, and the date and signature of the objecting party will suffice. Usually, the ex parte order or any referee proposed order should contain small print information on filing an objection. Otherwise, contact the court that sent you the copy of such an order and don't just leave a message if you can't get through to someone. Keep asking for a supervisor until you get your needed information. According to the State Court Administrator's Office, the Child Support Enforcement Agency or friend of the court is supposed to provide forms and instructions for filing an objection. 
But in the years I was employed by this agency, we were instructed not to give out this information, and no forms were available that we were able to give out. Question 10. Is it true that in 99% of cases that whoever is granted temporary custody receives permanent physical custody of the children as well? Answer, yes. Question 11. I read in our state rules of court handbook that both parties can offer his or her position in arguments at the time of hearing. But when I went in front of the referee, she told me hotly that I was only to answer the questions that she asked me. And she never gave me an opportunity to state my views. Is this common? Answer. Unfortunately, yes. Procedure requires that the FOC enforcement officer acting the part of prosecuting attorney will be sworn in and will then inform the referee or judge of any alleged violations or summarize the issues at hand. The referee or judge will then swear in the plaintiff's attorney to present the case on behalf of the plaintiff. If the plaintiff has no lawyer, the plaintiff, or the one bringing the issues to court, 90 to 98% mothers, will give her version of events and reasons why the court should rule as she asks. The defendant is not allowed to speak out to answer or refute her accusations in any way, or the referee or judge may get very rude and punitive with the defendant. The defendant's attorney is then sworn in if the defendant has one. The attorney can speak, but the defendant still cannot. If there is no lawyer for the defendant present, the defendant can be sworn in and answer the questions of the referee or judge. But if any information is given or discussed that is not directly pertinent to the exact question of the judge or referee or the issue at hand, the defendant will not be allowed to air these views. When two attorneys are involved, the procedures become very formalized and lengthy, and it takes 12 times longer to say whatever in the course of each attorney's answers to the last cross-examination, etc. It can be very frustrating for a defendant of either gender who has been accused of terrible things never to get a chance to vindicate himself or herself on record. Should a defendant speak out of order, however, the defendant may be treated as worse than guilty. The defendant will likely lose the opportunity for justice. Question 12. Can't the friend of the court write up an order that is obviously in the best interest of the children? Answer. Only a judge under proper jurisdiction can order a decision to become a judgment. The friend of the court gets his authority to act as an administrator of the court. Although the friend of the court employees may write up orders every day for the judge to sign, the agency answers to the judge and is supposed to be impartial as far as the parties are concerned. I use the term friend of the court because in the state of Michigan, that is what the child support custody and child support enforcement agency is called. But each state has a different name. But when I use the term friend of the court, it means the child support enforcement agency. Question 13. Why does it always seem that the friend of the court or child support enforcement officer always represents the mother's interests? Answer, the friend of the court represents its own interests. The number one stated priority of child support enforcement agencies is to ensure that parties comply with court orders. The number one priority in actuality is the collection of revenue. Money runs the agency, and collections determine the amount of money apportioned to run the agencies. Mothers are still awarded primary physical custody of the children in all but the most unusual cases. Since fathers are nearly always the payers of support, fathers are nearly always at odds with the purposes of the friend of the court. When a parental couple is summoned to court by that child enforcement division, it has been my experience that even when non-custodial mothers who are ordered to pay support under a court order do not pay, fathers in general are much more reluctant to drag the non-paying mother into court or even to report her non-compliance to the enforcement officer. In this day of heavy caseloads, most court proceedings are the result of a custodial parent who has made multiple complaints of non-payment of support money. Non-compliance with other aspects of the judge's order, parenting time violation and other non-money issues, are not treated with any urgency or consideration. We refer to the orders of the court as the orders of the judge, even if, 
an enforcement officer or other officer of the court writes up the order. Once the judge signs the order, it is called the judge's order. Judges do not write their own orders, but an officer of the court will write the order and the judge will sign it after procedures have been met. The Child Support Enforcement Agency is not looking out for the best interests of the children or the family, but for the best interests, the fiscal needs of the court. The same goes for the judge. His main objective is to have the orders of the court followed, especially when it has to do with finances. Question 14. There are A, paternity orders involving unmarried parents where the father of the child children is a question to be determined. B, family support orders where the father signs that he is the father of the children and yet where no divorce is involved. Cohabiting unmarried parents who separate or married couples who separate and yet are not divorced or among this group. C, divorce orders where married couples are filing for divorce, and D, miscellaneous action orders. Which orders does the Child Support Enforcement Agency actively enforce? Answer, the Child Support Enforcement Agency enforces all orders where support is ordered to be paid by the other party, either to the custodian of the children or to the state, which may have paid birthing expenses or welfare payments on behalf of the children. It used to take the consent or request of the children's caretaker in order for child support enforcement agencies to become actively involved, garnishing wages, etc. Now it usually takes a court order requesting that the agency refrain from enforcing the order to keep the agency out of your pockets and out of your family circle. When the child support enforcement agency becomes involved in a case, the authority of the parents to make final decisions on behalf of the children is given over to the authority of a judge who neither knows nor cares to know your children. Question 15. What happens when a couple works out their differences and gets back together with the children? Answer. This is underscored. Enforcement of a court-ordered support payment cannot be stopped except by a court order. Read over your latest court orders and determine whether there is a reconciliation clause. If the order reads that in the event of a reconciliation that child support or other payments will no longer be payable contingent upon the written, dated statement of both parties with case numbers included on the paper, then send a copy of a written statement including the date that you got back together, both of the parent signatures, your case number, and a reference to the clause in your order stating that, in quotes, in case of the reconciliation of the parties and so forth. But if your order does not contain such a clause, compose a written petition for a hearing date so that your court order can be modified. Just sending a notice to your enforcement officer will do you no good in that case. The sooner that you get your order changed, the better. When I say changing an order, actually orders are never changed, but the newest order will replace an older order. You must get another order to replace an order that is no longer relevant. The child support payment that is being deducted from your paycheck and sent to your wife may be eventually reaching the children if you do not get a new court order after reconciliation, but the service fees and other control over your finances will not end until your court order is appropriately changed or in other words, until you get a new order put through. Many fathers who have been living with their wives and children for many years are horrified to find years later that their unpaid child support balance has kept growing to astronomical proportions, that interest charges are being charged on this delinquent bill, and that the family's income tax refund checks, bank accounts, licenses, and assets are subject to seizure by the court. The court cannot and will not dismiss these arrearages if no new court order has been put into place. Be certain to keep your orders current to your present situation. 
The Child Support Enforcement Agency cannot dismiss your obligation to pay without the necessary court order. It is against the law to go retroactively dismissing an order of the past. So it is imperative that you file an order just as soon as the reconciliation takes place. Once you file to get into court, that order can go back to the first date of filing, but no farther. Sending in information is just not enough. I've yet to see a child support agency take it upon itself to change an order for the benefit of the parties without being forced into it by a new order of the court. Office policies forbid enforcement officers from being helpful, even when no revenue is involved. Question 16. My ex and I are not back together, but we have worked out some of the details of our divorce agreement in a way that is much better for ourselves and for the kids. If no one complains to the court or its agency, does it really matter if we follow the court order to the letter? Answer. In payment issues where the court or its enforcement agencies keep a record, it really matters a lot that you change your court order to keep up with current agreements and situations. In non-payment issues, it is still a better idea to change an outdated order, meaning to put in a new order to update the situation. Any couple can have a change of plans, moods, outlooks, friends, and situations to the extent that unwritten agreements are sometimes forgotten or blatantly ignored. Agreements between parties are only recognized by the courts and its agencies when the agreement has been written up as an order, when both parties have had proper written notice of a hearing to discuss the issues, and the procedures are followed through until the judge signs the new order into law. Note, if a referee hears the issues and sends both parties a copy of his or her recommendations that are not objected to by either party, the proposed order will probably be signed into law by a judge after a period of time, often 30 to 60 approximate days. Question 17. What happens to a family support order when the couple reconciles or divorces? Answer. When parents reconcile, they must be certain to update their court order. In other words, get a new order, which will reflect their current situation. If you don't know how to do this, locate the circuit court clerk of your county and ask for the proper form. They can assist you in choosing the correct form. You can take the form and you can file it on your own. There are many ways that you can follow the instructions for a pro per or pro se, which means do it yourself order without an attorney involved. If you prefer to get an attorney, that's fine too. Any amounts due the state or the agency for fees will still be payable as a rearage. As long as there are unpaid balances due, fees will be charged regularly. If a mother chooses to dismiss all or part of the back support due, to her, she can do so in a court hearing. When parents are granted an order for divorce after a family support order has already been in place, the divorce order takes the place of the former order. If any issues are not mentioned in the newer order, the previous order will still be binding for those aspects until changed by yet another court order. Any amounts of money due from the previous order that are yet unpaid will either be added to the newer order or will remain payable in addition to the new payments due. Most family support orders are started by the prosecutor's office after a referral from the local welfare office that benefits are being paid out. As an enforcement officer, I witnessed many separated parents who would reunite after the mother and children were currently receiving state aid. The father was working and not listed on the grant as living in the home. The parents continued to receive two incomes into the home. Sometimes the working father was aware that the unemployed mother was still receiving welfare checks, and sometimes he may not have been. When and if the father was summoned into court to explain why he was not paying his child support checks, he would state on record that he was living with the mother and children and had been for several years. The mother would agree to this. The child support enforcement officer could see from computer records that the mother and children were still receiving welfare payments, but there was no incentive whatsoever to end the fraudulent situation. 
As a busy officer, I reported these types of cases regularly to the welfare agencies who were not in the least bit interested in pursuing them, the public record of the court hearing. The best response I ever received from the welfare workers was, why don't you drop on by sometime and we can talk about it? Knowing that I couldn't leave work to do what was not on my job description and that the worker would be long gone before I ever left my workplace. It was not in anyone's best interest in government agencies to pursue fraud. Question 18. My estranged husband has asked that we schedule an appointment with a court mediator. What good will it do? Answer. My advice would be to hire a mediator of your own first. If you cannot find a trusted and experienced friend, counselor, or pastor, you would still do almost as well with a reasonably intelligent stranger off the street than you would do with a rookie attorney mediator at the court who doesn't know you or your children and could care less. The mediators, referees, and conciliators at the court agencies are seldom qualified counselors. Most are attorneys who didn't go into private practice or who did not succeed as such. These mediators only benefit when someone starts paying support and comes under their future jurisdiction. Any agreements or reconciliations that the parents can reach that do not result in agency dollars is just a waste of their time. Their salaries are paid from the court budget, and child support enforcement is a big money-making racket. Should you find no other qualified counselors and opt for the court mediator, remember that the viewpoint of the mediator will be biased toward court interests, not your family's best interest. Any proposed order from the court mediator will become an order of the court within 30 days, approximately, unless properly objected to by one or both parties in court. And even after a proper objection, the judge has the final say in whether he or she will sign the proposed order into law. Mediation for parents in conflict is a good idea if the mediator is not supplied by the Child Support Enforcement Agency. Court mediators, conciliators, and referees are put into place to save the judge time and unnecessary hearings. Try to find someone who actually has your best interest in mind. The friend of the court is gender biased and outdated in its thinking, but it is no more user friendly to concerned mothers than it is to fathers. The Child Support Enforcement Agency will only assist you if your interests happen to coincide with theirs. Give your family a chance before signing your souls over to the courts. All right. Question 19. I'm still confused about the difference between primary custody, sole custody, joint legal custody, and joint physical custody. What is the difference in the courtroom? Answer. Even a lot of judges and child support enforcement officers have a hard time defining legal custody. Supposedly, legal custody determines who decides the children's religious, medical, and educational issues. Joint legal custody is supposed to mean that parents will communicate and cooperate with each other in reaching decisions regarding the major medical, religious, educational, and area-wide decisions regarding the children. Area-wide meaning where the children will live, domicile, which state, which town, which country of the world. However, I've never seen any court even address the enforcement of such difficult and controversial issues. When questions of braces or operations or medical tests or religious trainings or celebrations were discussed, whatever parent had primary physical custody reigned infallible. In my opinion, attorneys and child support officials throw out the term joint legal custody in an order as a bone to pacify the non-custodial parent or fathers who are frantic to stay involved in their children's lives. The bone is fake, however, and gives the father or non-custodial parent nothing in reality. When educational issues were discussed, the Child Support Enforcement Agency, and thus the judge, opted for whatever the going standard is for public education. Often the family history and background were never considered. Whatever the enforcement officer or investigator recommended or whatever sounded like the norm to the judge was what the children would be ordered to receive. We might be comfortable for all children to get exactly what is usual and familiar until we, as concerned and loving parents, realize that what is usual and familiar to most children isn't the best or even good for our children for some reason. Primary custody means that the children live with one parent more of the time than the other. It isn't a particularly legal term, although it is used a lot. The enforcement personnel look for the words 
physical custody in order to determine which parent is the one who calls all the shots. Sole custody is also a word that is used less since it only becomes operant when used in conjunction with physical. Now for the really important one, joint physical custody. The term is a misnomer, joint physical custody is the term that every involved separated parent should have included in the order. Joint physical custody does not necessarily mean that the children spend exactly half the time with each parent, although that would be the ideal, if anything can be ideal about divorce or separation. Joint physical custody just means that the children live with one parent some of the time and with the other parent the rest of the time. Both parents have equal say in the medical and educational issues, but the responsibility for the children while they are in one parent's home is up to the discretion of the parent that the children are with. Of course, there will be occasionally differences of opinion about what is best, but that happens when both parents live under one roof just about as frequently. What will become less frequent when the children are not owned by one parent over the other is that the children are not constantly used to punish, spy on, antagonize, and control the ex-partner. Eventually, the estranged parents will work out a communication system, and it will be a healthy example for the children because the parents must learn to work together for the children. The friend of the court will not be helping to accelerate conflicts by taking sides. The parents can be back at the children's sides instead of at each other's throats at the taxpayer's expense and the children's demise. More deadbeat, in quotes, parents are pushed over the edge of frustration than are cured by the child support enforcement system. When a parent has nothing left to gain and everything is lost, it becomes easy to fade from the children's lives and disappear forever. Parents who stay actively involved in the children's lives in every way are much less likely to run off and forget their kids. I've never heard of that happening. Financial considerations for the children are important, but so are having both parents in their lives. Question 20. What are the criteria that the child support enforcement agencies use to determine who gets physical custody of the children? Answer. Child custody is supposed to be determined using the state's Child Custody Act guidelines. For example, the Michigan Child Custody Act states that the judge may consider the following factors when determining custody and parenting time issues. In parentheses, however, the judge seldom has the information and time to investigate these issues. So the judge always goes entirely by the recommendations of the friend of the court or other child support enforcement agency investigator, in quotes. A, the love, affection, and other emotional ties existing between the parties involved and the child. B, the capacity and disposition of the parties involved to give the child love, affection, and guidance, and the continuation of the education and raising of the child in its religion or creed, if any. C, the capacity and disposition of the parties involved to provide the child with food, clothing, medical care, and their remedial care recognized and permitted under the laws of the state in place of medical care and other material needs. D, the length of time the child has lived in a stable, satisfactory environment and the desirability of maintaining continuity. In other words, whoever, whichever parent or household the child has spent the most time in the most recently. Back to E, the permanence as a family unit of the existing or custodial home or homes. F, the moral fitness of the parties involved. G, the mental and physical health of the parties involved. H, the home, school, and community record of the child. I, the reasonable preference of the child if the court deems the child to be of sufficient age to express preference. This seldom happens that in court a child ever is asked a preference. Sometimes the 
in quotes, investigator may ask a child if the child is a teenager, but it isn't a given. Back to the handbook, J. The willingness and ability of each of the parents to facilitate and encourage a close and continuing parent-child relationship between the child and the other parent. K, domestic violence, regardless of whether the violence was directed against or witnessed by the child. L, any other factor considered by the court to be of relevance to a particular child custody dispute. Going back to my answer, even though these guidelines sound reasonable enough, the way an investigator, in quotes, comes to decide upon each item is extremely biased toward usually the mother and against the father or toward the first parent to come in speaking to the investigator. This may appeal to mothers, but mothers may think twice when they realize that as soon as there is a divorce or support order filed in the courts, that the children are no longer under the control of either parent, but become wards of the court. Parents, do you want your children's lives and final destiny determined by an unqualified, in quotes, investigator of the court system who neither knows nor cares about your particular child or family? Do you want your children to become like orphans, the wards of the court, to be dealt with by whatever measure some inexperienced stranger decides at the moment is adequate? One doesn't have to reread Oliver Twist in order to remember how wards of the court have been historically treated. Question 21. What is the worst offense of the child support agency? Answer. Every situation has its own degree of importance, and any offense that negatively impacts the family unit, especially children, is worthy of grave consideration. However, the most rampant wrong that I noticed as a child support enforcement officer was how the agencies feel that they are the law and so are above following the laws unless the particular law is a benefit to the agency. Child support Agencies twist and distort or totally disregard the laws that the agency is supposed to enforce. Privacy statutes are used as an excuse to deliberately withhold information that would assist clients in getting fair determinations on their cases. Policy dictates that enforcement officials not give out specific information on what the laws and policies actually say. When individuals ask how they can comply with the court order or agency policy, pat answers are supplied by supervision that only reflect the options that will bring in the most money to the agency. Enforcement officers and investigators are supposed to refer people to confer with an attorney for answers, and the agency, in turn, will tell the attorneys what to tell clients. Because of frequently changing office policies on how to interpret and enforce the laws and court orders, attorneys and child support agencies work together seldom in the best interest of the children and families involved. My mission as an enforcement officer was to tell clients what all their available options were so that they could comply with the orders of the court in whatever ways that they found were legal and efficient. I was sworn to this duty, and to that duty I dedicated my time. But by doing that, I was called social worker and was accused of conflict of interest. I was threatened with lawsuits for practicing law without a license and was disciplined for showing clients pages from the most recent office policy guides on enforcement of visitation, parenting time, etc. Child support agency personnel have more power when they can keep clients in the dark, begging for scraps of information. It is intimidating for parents to know that agency workers know the answers but are forbidden to give them out. Strained relations between frustrated and alienated parents learning the court system by a pathetic system of trial and, in parentheses, mostly error, do not benefit children caught in the middle. Withholding pertinent information from those striving to comply with the courts is a grievous wrong to all involved. In capital letters, our children deserve informed parents. This question and answer chapter was brought to you by permission of Carol Rhodes, the author, reading these questions, shared by permission, 
by the United Earth Fund, who brings this to you. It's a 501c3 nonprofit in the public interest.